Sailing in the open ocean, with a perfect sunrise dead ahead and a gentle breeze from behind. This is probably the kind of fantasy that fueled my father's perseverance. With the help of his friends, he spent five years building his dream sailboat. Once the Pilgrim was born, we sailed it from Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, 4,500 nautical miles across the Atlantic Ocean to Marseille in the south of France. This documentary will take you on board the Pilgrim to experience the adventure, the lifestyle, and the challenges we faced while putting our homemade sailboat through the ultimate test. James Warham's unique double canoe style sailing catamarans are designed to be built by the common man with very detailed, easy to follow plans. These sailboats are built entirely of marine plywood, fiberglass and epoxy. In 2004, Jacques fell in love with the Tiki 38 design which reflected his minimalist sailing ideologies and decided to build one under a tent at his friend Dave's farm. After one year of working on it part-time, he quit his job and went into it full-time. After the long cold winters building alone, Jacques' morale and motivation would be drained. So each spring, his twin brother Christophe and a few close friends flew in from France to help him for a few weeks. This is when the big operations took place, such as moving the hulls, making the beams, and fiberglassing huge areas. It was always the boost Jacques needed to keep moving forward. The Tiki 38 was small enough to be a realistic dream and big enough to have all necessary comforts for long distance offshore voyages. The deck pod includes a watch bunk and forward is 26 meters of safe usable deck space. The interior includes two double cabins, two single cabins, a galley, a navigation station, a bathroom, as well as good storage areas in the bow and stern. The steering system is tiller rope around a drum connected to the wheel, but it can be disengaged for direct steering if necessary. The rig has two masts, made with aluminum telephone poles. Compared to single-masted rigs, this system allows for smaller sails and lighter gear to handle. The sleeved mainsails reduce mass turbulence, allows for hoisting without having to head into the wind, and can be dropped in seconds. The boat took shape and we dreamt about the day it would touch the water. Two 9 horsepower outboard engines are fitted in boxes below deck that can be raised and lowered. Since they are amidships of the boat, it should maneuver quite well and rotate on itself. The building site became a popular spot. Many friends came to hang out and drink beers after work. For electricity, we used two solar panels connected to two car batteries. It provided enough electricity for GPS, lights, radio, water pumps, computers, and music. After five years, he was finally done building. It was time to transport all the parts to the local harbor and reassemble all the pieces in front of the launch ramp. Everything on the boat is connected with lashings, including the rudders. The four beams connecting the hulls are pinned down, then lashed with rope on each side of the hulls, providing shock absorption. Weighing only 3 tons, with a draft of 2.5 feet, 
the Pilgrim was finally ready to be launched. Friends and family gathered under the Pilgrim's construction tent as we celebrated the upcoming launch and trials of the Pilgrim happening the next day. was perfect, friends, family and bystanders all gathered for the show. The harbor did not have a lift wide enough for catamarans, so we used wheelbarrow wheels attached to cradles to roll the pilgrim to the water. The operation was a success as Jacques felt his creation coming to life under his feet. The day was not over. It was time for that first sail that we all dreamt about for so long. After a few minutes of figuring things out, we got the sails up and turned off the engines. The pilgrim was gliding. There was no wake, just the sound of the V-shaped hulls slicing through the water effortlessly. The rig was well balanced and the pilgrim sailed straight. have been better. We now had a functional vessel ready to be unleashed from the dock. For a while now, Jacques had planned to move back to his home country in the south of France. Sailing the Pilgrim across the Atlantic was the next logical step. The crew selected for this endeavor included Jacques as the captain, his twin brother Christophe, his Danish friend Soon, his younger brother Gilles, and myself his son. The plan was to start from Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, sail eastbound, make a pit stop in the Azores, then go through Gibraltar and sail up the Mediterranean to arrive in Lestac, Marseille in France. A total distance of about 4,500 nautical miles. We loaded up on food, water and 150 nautical miles worth of fuel while my mother added accessories that would help make our voyage more comfortable. The boat had only been tested for a few weeks in flat calm waters, but we trusted in James Warham's designs. This was it, the final evening safely attached to land. We all agreed that this was an adventure of a lifetime, and if we didn't attempt this, we'd regret it for the rest of our lives. Time to go. It was a dark and rainy morning. The crew's vibe was charged with adrenaline. My little sister was crying on the dock. It was no longer something we were gonna do. 
it was actually happening. Our first mission was to head south for a few hundred miles to intercept the Gulf Stream current and winds to add a couple knots to our cruising speed. This also allowed us to stay along the east coast for the first three days in case we needed to get back to land. On the second day, I was the first ever to use our toilet. Once you're done, you just have to put the bucket back in place with a little bit of water in it for the next person. It took us a few days to get the hang of life on board. We did not have a functional autopilot. Manual steering was necessary at all times. But we didn't mind, especially when the conditions got good. At night, we had two six-hour watches, two men on deck at all times, one would steer while the other was the sail handler. The fifth guy would cook for the day and get the night off, and we would rotate this position. For the first week, the weather was cloudy and inconsistent, and on the fifth night, we got hit by a thunderstorm. Strong winds and lightning struck all around us. Steering next to an ungrounded aluminum mast felt a little bit like playing Russian roulette. The next day we felt good knowing that the Pilgrim made it through okay. We suddenly had more confidence knowing that we could handle stormy weather. After a week of getting rained and sprayed on, we were wet to the bones. As soon as sunlight appeared, we attempted to dry our clothes. Sometimes after an entire day of drying, a wave would come and soak everything all over again. But apart from the tough weather conditions, the cruise spirit was good. We finally had a good routine going. Our world was based around one single purpose, to move forward and make way. So the cruise mood was directly connected to the weather and the performance of our boat.
One day, Christophe claimed that he was the current pilgrim speed record holder of 11.5 knots. This became a game, and whoever steered the boat into a new speed record was the current winner. Once we got into the Gulf Stream, the wind and weather got more favorable, and the waves started to get bigger. The Pilgrim was light, and with the correct speed and momentum, we discovered that it was excellent for catching waves. Once we tasted our first proper surf, we got hooked. That was all we wanted to do. We spent our days blasting music and catching waves. The trick is to head up slightly and gain some speed. As soon as you see a nice wave arrive, you suddenly head down with it and the boat starts surfing. This technique led to Jacques' shattering record of 15.1 knots. Spring break cleaning. Oh, there's spring cleaning. There was a two, huh? The good thing about making your own sailboat is that you can fix anything. The beam was moving slightly and rubbing against the side, so we used a small piece of wood and some olive oil to fix the issue. Since we were now in the trade winds, we thought the weather was going to stay good, but it was not the case. 30 to 45 knot winds kicked in hard and the swells followed. The storm lasted three days. The scariest night of my life happened on the second night. We only had the storm jib out, but we were still overpowered. Gilles almost fell overboard, and it was too risky to go forward to take down the jib. If we headed down too much, we would go into huge uncontrolled surf down massive waves. And if we headed up too much, we would head up sideways to the seas and risk capsizing or getting hit by breakers from the side. So we held on for dear life in complete darkness, staring at the compass desperately trying to hold course. As soon as the light was back, we finally took down that storm jib. We received high doses of adrenaline for three days straight. When it was over, we were completely drained. But we felt accomplished and figured it was as bad as it could get. Only 24 hours after the storm, a massive squall showed up on the horizon. There was no way to outrun this monster, so we dropped all the sails and deployed our sea anchor. The familiar feeling of adrenaline was back in full effect. hit us so hard 
that the shackle of the sea anchor gave out. The Pilgrim accelerated to 9 knots without any sails. Lucky for us, it only lasted a few minutes before the winds came down again. With the bad weather behind us, we felt proud and accomplished. We had no more doubts about the pilgrim's seaworthiness anymore, and the sense of security made us feel at home. Another shackle failed. This time it was the one for the halyard pulley connected to the top of the mast. So I went up the mast to make a temporary repair. We were at sea for two weeks and we never saw a single ship. We were totally alone the entire time, so seeing the Azores on the horizon was a wonderful feeling. docked at 10 p.m. in the dark and enjoyed a quiet, peaceful night in the calm, safe harbor of Orta. The next day, we got busy and fixed multiple things on the boat, including putting up the new halyard shackle, fixing one of the decks that got pushed up by a wave during the storm, and reinforcing one of the rudder tillers that was also damaged. We then shopped for fresh food, got ourselves some fishing gear, enjoyed a hot shower, and ate a proper restaurant meal. We left one of our pilgrim t-shirts in the legendary Peter's Cafe sport bar and departed Orta at 10 p.m. The stop was only 24 hours long, and leaving the dock this time was harder than the last. The next morning, the wind was gone. After downloading some U-Gribs and talking with his friend that works as a sailboat racing weather strategist, Jacques decided to head up north, almost the opposite direction that we needed to go, in order to find some wind. We spent three days in the calm ocean going away from our goal. It was not an easy pill to swallow. So we found ways to stay busy. Ha <laughs> ha! 
became our world, and our normal lives on land felt like a distant memory. The feeling of not having the pressure to be productive in any way felt wonderful, and we enjoyed the simplicity of the present moment. We finally turned back east, as the wind became favorable again. Sometimes, when laying in my bunk, I could hear the dolphins talking around me. so familiar with the boat that we could tell who was steering from our bunks just by the way the pilgrim moved. A week after the Azores, we reached the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, welcomed by an amazing sunrise over the cliffs of Sagres in Portugal. The 
decided to stop for breakfast and a quick trip to the shop. Sagres is a salty little fishing town. It was basically deserted, and it felt like we landed on another planet. We stayed two hours and went back out in beautiful conditions. Our next challenge is to go through the Strait of Gibraltar. Known for its strong winds, current and heavy boat traffic, it's important to go through in the right conditions. Gibraltar connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea and separates Europe from Africa. We went through easily with 40 knots of wind pushing us along. Gilles even managed to raise the speed record to 15.8 knots. Once we got into the Mediterranean Sea, the weather became hot and sunny as we made our way up the coast of Spain. This is the kind of weather the pilgrim was made for. We quickly stopped for two hours in Benidorm, Spain for a few drinks with Sun's dad who happened to be on another sailboat cruising around for the summer. We only had a little bit left to go and calculated that we should arrive on the 12th of July. We called our friends and family and told them to meet us on the main dock of Listac sometime during that day. Then we stopped in Ibiza for the night to wait for the wind to change direction. On the morning of July 12th, we still had about 90 nautical miles to go. We were running late for our planned arrival, and if we didn't sail hard, we would not make it on time to celebrate with our loved ones. During the whole day, we suffered strong, inconsistent winds. We reefed, dropped, and put the sails back up again multiple times.
slowly pushed the boat harder and harder throughout the day. And when land became visible on the horizon, we decided to go all out and put all the sails up, putting us in an overpowered reach in 25 knots of wind on the final mile of the voyage. Six knots. We managed to beat our speed record on the last mile of a 4,500 nautical mile journey. It was glorious. We arrived late afternoon in the most perfect way possible. 